before I start, I would like to convey the greetings of Elizabeth Tabaldi, my head of unit, and of uh, Zoe Constantino, who is my twin in Digimare on this file, at least. <laughs> we were very closely. The, the boss would have liked to be there today, but it's a bit of a demanding period in terms of <laughs> of work and and presence in meetings. Yeah. So I'm going to give you a short overview of what we're doing on the European Digital Twin of the Ocean. I believe that many of you might have already seen some of the slides, but still, I think it's very useful to repeat some key messages. And then I trust uh, that Pierre will will complete and detail some of the aspects after me. So thank you, Pierre, in advance. So as a reminder, the EU DTO has been promised by President von der Leyen at the One Ocean Summit in Brest in February 22. And it's one of the key deliverable of the EU mission restore ocean and waters, specifically under the cross-cutting enabler, which is the digital ocean and water knowledge system. It, it's a file that has started pretty quickly because actually we realized uh, that the very first discussion on trying to build something like that is not even three years old. We, we started uh, thinking about it uh, for the Mission Work Program 21, and that was in July of uh, 21 that we did it. So in three years, as I hope I will be able to demonstrate, and I hope that you will be able to see in the Digital Ocean Forum in June, there has been quite a lot of progress and momentum and expectations, which we will also need to, to manage. Uh, that's not necessarily the easiest part of the job. So maybe as a, a reminder of what we consider uh, as a digital twin, because there are many different interpretation of what digital twins are, whether it's just a system which allows one to access data and, and monitor uh, a system so that it's, it's purely a digital representation of of a real-time system like the ocean or whatever. Um, other sees digital twins are purely models and forecastings. We have the perspective and the vision that it is something more to that. It relies heavily on that, but it is more because the end point of the EU DTO is to be able to have a user interface, which is pretty simple for not necessarily lay people, but people who don't have all the expertise, uh, the scientific expertise behind it, to be able to play with a system that is of their own interest, uh, planting aquaculture, doing uh, a uh, nature-based solution for coastal protection, uh, doing uh, maritime spatial planning, planting renewables offshore, uh, you name it. And what we want to do is to provide them with a tool which allows them to test different solutions and to see how these solutions will be affected by possible chains in the next decade or, or so, in, at least in the time frame that is relevant for the investments, for instance. So it's really that interactive layer coupled with the forecasting, uh, the, the predictive capability of, of the models and the data fed by the data. So we're strongly believers that these uh, approaches will develop by themselves because we are in a era where data accumulates at a large speed, uh, not at the same speed in all the sectors, but still the models, the computing capacities evolve enormously fast. So we are convinced that digital twin for specific application will pop up and will be developed in, in many domains. Now in the world of the ocean, uh, it is much more complex to do so than if you are doing a digital twin of a factory of a specific chemical process uh, or, or <laughs> name it. The ocean is extremely complex. And what we want to do with the EU DTO is to facilitate this development by providing a core infrastructure, a service to all those who would like to develop such digital twin application. So we want to facilitate 
the development of a digital twin ecosystem for ocean sectors and ocean uh, applications. The way we want to go about it, and it's really about structuring and integrating the ocean knowledge value chain for the ocean actor, is by integrating the assets that we have already today with IT uh, infrastructure, such as cloud computing, uh, cl cloud storage, artificial intelligence, high performance computing, uh, and whatsoever, and with uh, a number of tools to be able to, to interact with the models and the data in a meaningful way. So that is how we see the um, architecture of the EU DTO. So it's based on three components, essentially, a notion data space, which contains or which provide access to the data in the in the uh, how to say in a way that is fitted for the users for instance so if you need uh, a lot of data for high performance computing and to run models you need to have the data close to the places where you run the models uh, you have different uh, aspects linked to that whether people want to keep the data for themselves whether they want to share it when they want to put it on on a storage place temporarily but keep the rights i mean there are many different um possibilities around that. And we want to start with the assets that we have, that is mainly the data, the in-situ data coming from EMODNET and the data which comes from the satellite data through the Copernicus Marine Service. And of course, the data from the marine infrastructure, most of them being channeled through EMODNET. And then gradually, we would like to be able to extend to other sources of data which are not part of this first uh, asset that we are integrating at the moment. Although our intention is to try to have most of the new data channeled through Emonet. We want really Emonet to be the main data ent or entry point to access data, but not everything will be able to, to go through Emonet. So we need to be access to be able to access the data which lies other in other places. And then last but not least for, for the data, we have all the data that comes from the from running the model themselves, which need to be av available to, to users as we don't want to repeat uh, running the models multiple times if, if it is not necessary. The second part of the core DTO is what we call the DTO engine, and which contains the models. And there in the long term, we want to have models covering, of course, the physics, but also the ecosystem and all the socioeconomical dimension. So we will go gradually to that. Now we have already, we are relying on the existing models that are run by the Copernicus Marine Service, but gradually we will improve these models and integrate ecosystem models. It's already being done through Editor Model Lab um, and integrate them with artificial intelligence systems to have, to have more powerful uh, predictive capacity. And then the third pillar of this core infrastructure is an interactive co-working environment where people can come in with their own perspective and with what they want to develop in a specific uh, sea basin for a specific purpose. And we want them to have access to uh, different applications, uh, to, to access the data, to access the models, to feed in with their own data, to run it, uh, to develop the interfaces. And we have there, or we will have at some point, a number of services that will support these developments. We have three pillars of actions for building this EU DTO, the core infrastructure, as we call it. The first one is the sign base, where we rely on all the projects that are working on matters that are directly relevant to the digital twin of the ocean. Then we have the core infrastructure, which is being developed essentially through the Mission Ocean Work Program. And then we have the EU DTO in the world, as it really makes nonsense to work on the digital twin uh, of the ocean if we don't relate with similar initiatives that are being developed worldwide. So we need to make sure that this overall uh, interoperability um, between the different initiatives. 
So that's what it looks in the mission work program. So we started in 21 with two projects, one being a DITO infra, which is an, um, a grant to identified beneficiaries. And the identified beneficiaries, you will hear one of them just after me, it's Mercator Ocean. And the other one is the Flanders Marine Institute. The reason for choosing these two is of course, because of the expertise, but it is essentially because they are the main operators of the programs, which consist of the two main assets that we are building on, and that is eModNet and the Copernicus Marine Service. For eModNet, of course, the situation is very complex with a network composed, I think, of about 100 or 120 entities. And so here, the role of Liz is a coordinator, and they must rely on the inputs from the different partners of eModNet. So they're an intermediate uh, body, bringing also, of course, all its uh, um, expertise and knowledge in, in managing databases, uh, in particular for biodiversity. The second uh, project is Edito Model Lab, which is developing this underlying model that will be running on the EU DTO infrastructure. And these are advanced models that are developing. As I said, there's a lot of artificial intelligence which is being integrated there. Then we, in 22, we had a second call where there we really aimed at uh, biodiversity data because we all know that this is one of the key issues if we want to have meaningful models and then predict and pre 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 predictions which can feed the DTO. So we have two pretty big projects uh, 10, 10 million euro each, which are there to try to integrate the biodiversity data, which we know exist out there, but which we don't have access to, to eModNet, uh, for instance, at this point. And then we have one CSA, which is looking specifically at uh, eDNA and how to develop uh, a database or reference library of uh, genomic sequences, et cetera. Then we have, Coming very soon, two projects which are more uh, two project, two topics which are more future looking. One is uh, about the integration of the socio-ecological models, but it's really a research and innovation uh, actions. There we will have four projects which are in final stage of, of finalization, so we will be able to to name them very soon. And then the other project is is on the go or has been signed, it is named, is ideation. And that's a CSA to see, to develop a roadmap, to see how we can integrate all the aspects of inland waters into the EU DTO. So we don't necessarily want all the inland waters to be completely integrated into the EU DTO, but we need to make sure that the coastal aspects and the land sea interaction is properly covered. And then I'm very happy to announce that uh, last week, or even this week, we had <clears throat> the publication of the Mission Work Program 2024, and that in that Mission Work Program, we have a grant uh, for the second phase of EU DTO, which is again given to Mercator and, uh, and Vliz. It's a significant scale up with the idea that we will further and develop the services that will really increase the data sources and the models. And it, that it will support the development of uh, user-driven applications. And actually you will see uh, in the slide that it's quite a big budget. A large part of that budget is actually expected to be either subcontracted, either given to entities through the, what we call the cascading funds. So goals organized by Edito and giving out uh, subsequent uh, grants to people who want to develop and integrate their, their development into the EU DTO. Um, that we have said many times, but the EU DTO is an inclusive and open initiative. And that is why it is so important for us to make sure that every player, every community can feel engaged and can contribute into the development of the UDTO. And that there are two ways for the community to be involved. Either it is by giving what they see as necessary requirements or services that the UDTO should be providing for them to be useful. 
and then it is their own contribution to the development of the EU DTO. So what in your project, in your initiative, could be of interest to the core EU DTO and that we could provide to ensure that they are taken up and exploited over the years? Because it is a clear intention for the European Commission that is, this is not a short-term initiative which will end by the end of the project. We really have plans, and that is supported by many services of uh, of the Commission, to have it run as an operational program in the next uh, MFF, so from 27 onwards. Um, so as I said, it must be co-developed in collaboration with willing project and stakeholders. It must support the development of applications, specific applications, of local applications, and it must be, very importantly, interoperable with other similar initiatives, as I said. And that is where the science base and the digital uh, ocean forum comes in place, because this is one of the main channels for through which the code development can take place. Uh, we had, uh, I think, a very successful digital ocean forum last year in Brussels. And uh, the next one in June 13 will be a bit different, although we also have uh, the scientific and technical workshop with uh, 70 projects being represented and who will work on further developing and designing the DTO. But the Digital Ocean Forum this year will essentially be the occasion to unveil the first prototype of, um, of a DTO. And uh, Pierre will tell you all about it in a minute. And then last point is how we handle the EU DTO with uh, initiatives around the world. So of course, we are trying to link with what happens uh, within the EU 27. And most importantly, we are trying to make sure that we make a good usage of the extraordinary opportunity that is offered by the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And that is why we are strongly supporting through a bit of finances, but also a lot of political support to a number of programs that we consider key in the in the decade, and that is DITO, the Ocean Data Sharing uh, Collabor um, Coordination Center, and then the Ocean Prediction. And I hope that uh, we will also be able to link better with the Coastal Resilience uh, Collaborative Center. Um, in the G7 Future of the Seas and Ocean Initiative, I was personally very happy that we reached the decision that all the members <coughs> would channel their efforts through these key programs and in particular through DITO. And there I'm grateful to another speaker who is following uh, me uh, later this morning. It's Ute, who has a leading role in one of the working groups uh, that supports DITO on on the interoperability turtle. I don't know whether you are going to talk about that Uta later, but I think this is a very important work that you are doing there. And of course, all the work of the Ocean Prediction and the people who, who participate in the steering committee of uh, the different programs. So I think that's it. I talked about the Digital Ocean Forum uh, on the 13th of June. It uh, has been... Uh, very successful. It raised a lot of interest, maybe too much, because within two weeks, the registration had to be closed because we reached and actually went significantly over the capacity of the audience. So we will need to find some uh, some ways out of that. But uh, it is going to be webcasted, uh, so everybody will have the possibility to follow the discussion and to see these first prototypes of the EU DTO and, and what it can done. It can do. <laughs>